When I rebooted this channel in 2018, there were a few interesting and unique systems I really wanted to cover, like the Intel Skull Trail, the EVGA SR2, but there was always one more, even more difficult to find system. And it's this, the Quad Socket 64 core Optron. This is quite possibly one of the most ridiculous PCs I've ever seen. It has quad sockets, 192GB of memory, 26 fans and 2 power supplies. Today we'll have a closer look at this system, see how fast it is, run some benchmarks and, yes, play some games on it. But we'll start with a bit of context. As I mentioned in the video I did on AMD Quad FX, a system based on earlier Opterons, their strength lied in their advanced architecture. Whereas Intel was still running a frontside bus based architecture, AMD was years ahead of the curve using both an integrated memory controller and, via their direct connect architecture, they could easily scale to multiple CPUs with fantastic bandwidth between them using the hypertransport bus. Combine this with Intel's lackluster netburst chips, and things went swimmingly for AMD for quite a long time. However, by the time AMD switched from Optron Socket F to Socket G34 in 2010, they had been suddenly losing ground for years. And to make matters worse, Intel had finally adopted a similar architecture with their Nehalem chips and its QuickPath interconnect. So by the time AMD phased out their old K10 architecture with the Magni Cores Opterons in favor of Bulldozer in 2011, they went all in, offering up to a whopping 16 cores per CPU. And in a 4 socket configuration, this meant a total of 64 cores, depending on your definition of a core, of course. Now that all sounds rather exotic, but. The thing is, compared to, say, Skull Trail, the Quad G34 systems aren't actually that rare. There are plenty of decommissioned motherboards and CPUs available, but issues arise in making it all work, the practical side of things. The first is housing it, as most of these systems were used for professional rendering applications housed in smaller blade servers, but if for whatever reason you wanted all of this CPU power but in a desktop PC form, Supermicro had you covered with this the Super Chassis 748TQ R1400B, and it's truly unlike any other consumer desktop PC case, as not only was it designed specifically to house these crazy motherboards, but also maintain all the regular server features you'd expect. Which brings us to the motherboard, and, well, just by looking at it, you can see that while well, you'd need a special case, it's flipping enormous. In fact, Supermicro uses their own proprietary form factor for these boards, SWTX. And this model specifically is the H8QG6-F. And what makes it special is not only do we have these quad sockets, we have 32 DIMM slots for up to one terabyte of memory, we have three chipsets and an LSI SAS controller, but we also have five PCI Express slots, two of which are X16 for, say, GPUs, and yes, we'll be gaming on this in a bit. Which brings us to the second problem with crazy motherboards like these, and that is powering it, as it takes not two, but three 8-pin EPS power connectors. And even the most high-end consumer power supplies only come with two of those. And as uptime is crucial for what these kind of machines were used for, the Super Chassis comes with two 1400 watt 80 plus gold 1U server power supplies in a redundant setup. They are hot swappable and there's even room for a third. And above the power supplies we find the five hot swappable hard drive cages connected to the SAS controller. So this is really a server in a desktop form and it also adheres to the 4U server height so you can actually add rails to it and slide it into a server rack. As you might have seen already there are some funky looking features on this case and that's because the previous owner of this system was actually using it in an office and he wanted to reduce the noise levels a bit but he went a bit mad in the process of doing so. First of all he replaced the G34 CPU coolers with these very fancy Noctua NH-U12-DOA3s. Now these were specifically designed for socket G34 and were around 50 euros each. They're rather overkill, but oh boy do they look good. However, to make room for this top cooler, he actually had to 
drill out the top of this case here and then he added an empty fan housing here and on top two 140mm Noctua industrial fans. On the inside he also replaced the hot swappable 7500 RPM fans with these two uh, Leon Lee fans. On the side panel he added another two and finally to top it all off he added a rather fancy fan controller on the front. So let's see the result of all those modifications. I've plugged in the system and it is currently turned off but already we are drawing 22 watts of power and that is because the server power supplies always have their fans running when power is applied to them. And yeah, it is still pretty loud. Currently drawing already 300 watts on boot up. And after a boot time of around 2 minutes or so, we're sitting here idle in Windows 10. And this machine can't just run any version of Windows to make use of those 4 CPUs. If you have a dual socket system, you need Windows 10 Professional, but if you want to make use of 4 CPUs, you need Windows 10 Professional 4 workstations. A rather peculiar version, but we're running it here and sitting idle on the Windows desktop. We're already drawing a toasty 250 watts of total system power, which is a lot. And now we can also load up CPU Z to see the kind of CPUs we're running. So here we have four Opteron 6282SEs, a higher end 16 core part from the Interlagos bulldozer generation, with a base clock of 2.6 GHz and a boost of up to 3.3 GHz, with 60 MB of L2 and L3 cache. Now, for the memory, originally this system came with 192 gigabyte of registered DDR3 1600, but Supermicro recommends running four DIMMs per CPU for optimal performance, so I've reduced it to only 128 gigabyte. But what do 64 bulldozer cores at 3 gigahertz equate to in terms of performance? Well, I've got Cinebench R15, and let's give it a go. And just look at how those cores go. And we have 2,631 points, which actually isn't that bad. By sheer brute force, it is able to outpace the much higher clocked 10 core 16 thread Alder Lake i5 12600K. But for that, we are using a whopping 780 watts under load. For those interested, here are the Cinebench R20 and R23 results. Like in Cinebench, we can see in the web tests Speedometer, Octane, and Kraken that the single thread performance is only on the level of Intel Core 2 Penryn chips. Not great, but to be expected from a bulldozer chip. In other multi-threaded tests like POV ray rendering and Y-Cruncher Pi calculation, it is able to get close to the i5-12600K again. And in Y-Cruncher we got the highest power consumption yet, at 840 watts or a 590 watt difference over idle. The Geekbench 5 results are far from flattering with terrible multi-threaded performance, but in 7-zip decompression it puts down an impressive result, and in CPUs that multi-threaded, it is also able to outperform the Alder Lake i5. But overall we see that Windows 10 just isn't able to extract all the potential performance from the system, as it can't really handle all these cores over 4 CPUs that well. Like you can see here in DaVinci Resolve, the utilization is all over the place, and as a result the 12600K is nearly 3 times as fast when rendering the same video. So in a future video I'd like to see if Linux could improve performance, so make sure to be subscribed for that. One thing I was particularly interested in with this system was the core to core latency, in other words the access time for one core to access the other, and with most normal systems that is reasonably straightforward. Here are the results of my i5-12600K, and we can see the difference between the P and the E cores, but for the most part the results are reasonably homogeneous ranging from around 5 to 50 nanoseconds of access time. However, with this system, not only do we have much larger CPUs, but we also have them physically apart from each other. And looking at the topology of the system, we can see that, in theory, each CPU should only be one hop away from each other, as they're all interconnected via various hypertransport buses. 
And here are the results, and when your cortical latencies look like a piece of abstract art, you know something interesting is up. Actually, it's quite a big mess, with latencies ranging from 50 to a whopping 370 nanoseconds. What we can see nicely is that these 16-core chips are actually comprised of two 8-core clusters, and within Windows they are recognized as a total of 8 NUMA nodes. But for now some more digging is required to discover the logic behind this. And now it's time for gaming, because of course it is. But whereas the previous owner used this GTX 750 Ti, we're gonna need something with a bit more oomph. I'm thinking GTX 1080. Well, now the question remains, will it work? RGBs. But what about video? Oh yes, we're in business. Starting with Battlefield 564 players. And as running Battlefield 5 on a system like this is like a bodybuilder doing some hula hooping, I didn't exactly have high hopes. But here the performance is perhaps better than expected, running between 50 and 25 FPS depending on how player dense the map is. What we can also see here is that Battlefield 5 uses only the first CPU, so 16 cores are utilized, and in Task Manager that is seen in the first two nodes. Next up is a lighter title, Grand Theft Auto 5, and here it runs quite nicely, between a consistent 35 to 45 FPS, and personally I'd be quite fine playing it on this system. And just like Battlefield 5, GTA sticks to just one CPU, or 16 cores. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here we see something interesting. Performance is rather poor, averaging only 37 FPS, but we do see that CPU 1, half of CPU 2 and half of CPU 4 are loaded, for a total of 32 CPU cores which are utilized. Perhaps this is due to DirectX 12. Now onto the most impressive result so far with Doom on the Vulkan API. And here it's real smooth, running between 60 and 90 FPS with consistent frame times. And what's fascinating here is the amount of cores it uses. Half of CPU 1, half of CPU 2, half of CPU 3 and the entirety of CPU 4. For a total of 40 cores utilized. I certainly would like to test another Vulcan game because this is great. And finally this wouldn't be a fully buffered video without Grand Theft Auto 4. And it's not super smooth but playable at around 30 to 40 FPS, with 8 cores utilized. Overall the gaming performance is a bit better than I'd had expected, and I certainly don't think Supermicro had this in mind as a use case for this system. But we can do some silly things with all this CPU power and memory, because we can assign programs not only to CPU cores, but to entire CPUs. So perhaps on one CPU we might be running Grand Theft Auto 5, then on another can be playing some Battlefield 5. Moving on to another, we can perhaps run a benchmark of some sort. And finally, we can on another be editing some video, just because we can. To conclude, this system is very big, very loud, very power hungry, and by modern standards not even that fast but it is undeniably awesome. And for future content, I've got some things in mind, like a CPU upgrade, but what would you like to see? Please do leave a comment below. And also, if you have any experience with multi-socket systems like this, please do leave a comment below also. It took a lot of time and effort to get all of this together, so if you have enjoyed it, a like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. Well, that was all for now, and bye-bye.